So I now want to present some new data uh, w that was funded by the Institute um, to look at what happens when you hypnotize people in the scanner. So uh, there was a great deal of work. This was one of the error grants that we got that was very helpful to us in screening 545 subjects to come up with 36 extremely highly hypnotizable individuals, 21 low hypnotizables, and we matched a subgroup of highs to the lows so that we could have an exact fit between the two, um, and then created a series of tapes that we played for them while they were in the fMRI scanner so that we could compare four conditions. We had two hypnotic conditions, uh, a memory of a, of a happy experience, just a positive emotion state, uh, a memory of a vacation, and then we had just a resting state combination and a memory task to control for the memory aspects of the hypnotic experience. And um, there were two kinds of analyses we did of the differences in these states. And we had people rate their hypnotic experience in the scanner. They were able to do it. Uh, they didn't find the clanking of the, the uh, magnet uh, di terribly distracting. Uh, and what we looked for were between and within group interactions. So what happened to high hypnotizables when they were hypnotized that we didn't see either in them when they were not hypnotized or among low hypnotizables in the, same, in the matching conditions? Um, and there were three categories of findings that we had. Uh, one is FALF is a way of, of computing activity uh, in, in a specific brain region. Uh, and what we see here was a significant drop in activity in the dorsal anterior cingulate among the high hypnotizables compared to the lows and among the highs compared to what they had earlier in the non-hypnotic conditions. And here you see a correlation between the degree to which all 36 highs thought they were hypnotized and activity in the dorsal anterior cingulate. And it's a, it's a marked relationship. So highs drop activity in the ACC when they go into a hypnotic state. And that makes sense. If the ACC is there to tell you what to worry about, what to pay attention to, it makes sense that when you engage in the intense absorption of hypnosis, you're deciding that you don't need to worry about all the other things you might be worried about or thinking about. So it goes consistent with the notion of hypnotic absorption. The second uh, finding had to do with, there are two now related to functional connectivity, one positive, one negative. The positive relationship we found was between the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which was our seed region, and uh, the insula uh, in particular, the insular cortex and the supramarginal gyrus. Now, the insula is a very interesting brain region that has a lot to do with mind-body control. It should be of particular interest to this institute. And um, it makes sense that you're connecting the part of the brain that engages in tasks, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, with a part of the brain that helps you regulate what's going on in your body and body sensations as well. Also, the supramarginal gyrus, which has to do, it's part of the parietal lobe, has to do with lexical processing, and is part of the mirror neuron network. It's part of the brain that helps us connect with other people. And it, it makes sense in terms of the suggestibility, the sensitivity to social cues, that you see in hypnosis. So we found more functional connectivity, an increase in functional connectivity in highs, uh, no increase in low hypnotizables, and again correlated with the degree to which they, they experienced themselves as hypnotized while they were in the scanner. Finally, we found a, an inverse relationship between dorsolateral prefrontal cortex here, again this was the seed region, uh, and um, functioning of the default mode network. So that's the um, uh, posterior cingulate cortex and the dorsal medial, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex, ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And that indicates that when you're engaged in hypnosis, you're not ruminating about yourself. And it actually adds to the, the understanding of dissociation. So people will engage in hypnotic experiences. They, they often won't remember what they did. They certainly don't identify, well, I was trying to do it. Well, my hand just wanted to float up. I wasn't trying to do it. And we think it has to do with this inverse relationship between in being hypnotized and functioning uh, of the uh, default mode network. So these are some of our new findings. We're uh, eager to move on and learn more about this, and particularly in relation to pain control, and I'll show you some data about that. But we're beginning to understand what's going on in the brain when people enter these uh, altered states. Some older data that we and others have, this is uh, looking at the relationship between um, a homo vanillic acid, which is a dopamine metabolite in the CSF of people who we had measured hypnotizability. And you see about a 0.65 correlation 
between their hypnotizability and dopamine metabolites. The brain regions I talked about, frontal cortex, ACC, are dopamine-rich regions in the brain. And so if there is one neurotransmitter that's related to hypnosis, it most likely is, in fact, dopamine. And there are several studies now that show that a polymorphism in the catechol-omethyltransferase gene, uh, the valine methionine heterozygotes, tend to be more hypnotizable than the homozygotes for either valine or methionine. And these are people who are more cognitively and perceptually flexible. This is the same gene that has been implicated in schizophrenia as well. Schizophrenics as a group are not at all hypnotizable. We were doing a study of this, and my research assistant calls me up and said, Spiegel, you're testing this guy, not me. And I said, why? Well, he's a paranoid schizophrenic whose core delusion is that his brother-in-law is controlling his mind with hypnosis, and I'm not. <laughs> so, so I went and introduced myself and explained the wonders of science and said, of course, you don't have to do this if you don't want. And he said, go right ahead, Doc. I've always wanted to know how that son of a bitch does it to me. <laughs> and he wasn't even a little bit hypnotizable, not a bit. So uh, this is a study uh, that Amir Raz and colleagues published. Pesach Lichtenberg has also shown this, that the valine methionine heterozygotes on the COFT gene are more hypnotizable than homozygotes. So there may be a genetic component to hypnotizability as well. So what we think is that there's a kind of transformation, and that was the title of my talk with a C, uh, in which normally, you know, you can think of the brain as crudely divided into the front part, which is the effector half. It's the part that is engaged in motor function, in planning, in speech, the part in which we control the world. And there's a receptor portion in the back where we process input from the world, auditory, visual, somatosensory, um, and in general, so we think of ourselves as having control over what goes on in the front part of the brain and not having control over the back. But in hypnosis, you actually use words to transform perceptions. So some of our ability to manipulate experience is not just from speech and motor activity, but from the ability to control our own perceptual processes, and that makes it very useful in clinical activity. So let me show you some examples of how we use it in clinical care. Here's one example of... Uh, uh, St. Sebastian uh, getting through his um, sainthood. 